institutional networks are going to be important for getting the meta information. You know, knowing what data is currently driving the market, knowing what kinds of information to pay attention to. And a lot of that isn't in your standard textbook. So that would include monitoring capital flows to try and anticipate market movements, you know, trying to figure out, well, where are the big trades going to be com coming? You know, if we know that one major bank has just taken on a, a, a big deal or a takeover, they probably won't be doing that again this week. So we can kind of relax, they won't be in the market again. And also in the validation of current trading frames and fundamentals, what's currently driving the market? And that's a very different model from the neoclassical view that sees prices as simply reflecting relatively passively a set of objective conditions in an external market environment. What this is saying is that the very net nature of fundamentals, the very categories that we use to evaluate prices and determine values, is itself subject to continuous renegotiation and contestation. Now, that suggests that in times of volatility or where market cycles are changing, you're, you're likely to get an intensification of this self-referential monitoring of market actors phoning each other up, trying to double check, well, what, what's, the, what's the current buzz concept? What's driving the market today? Well, when I was talking to traders, it happened to be American payroll figures. Why was that important? Well, apparently, one said, it's not particularly important, but the Reserve Bank said they were monitoring it. Um, oh, so that means that everybody's going to follow the Reserve Bank. And it, it becomes important because, you know, everybody else is looking at it and monitoring it. It's not because it's necessarily objectively important, but if everyone else thinks it's important, it becomes important. You know, if everyone decides that Bill Clinton's affair with Monica Lewinsky is important, you know, it becomes important. It starts affecting financial markets. So there are all kinds of things that, that will therefore drive market values that have got nothing to do with your standard textbooks. And so this contingency is, 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 is a key factor in, in understanding how the media play a role here. So what was I doing? Well, what I was trying to do uh, was develop a framework that could emphasize this idea of intersubjective codification, that, that what underpins markets and, and social action in general is as mutually, un, uh, mutually understood and recognized modalities of social action and ascriptions of meanings to those actions. And we have to live in the same symbolic universe. And in, in this sense, communicative reflexivity becomes important because I'm using this as a, as a basis to draw together insights from standard political economic perspectives, but also to draw in insights from cultural economic perspectives. So this is overcoming the, the classic sort of political economy versus cultural studies divide. So I use this idea of intersubjective codification to try and theorize also social system boundaries, you know, so the, the demarcations of the life world from the polity, from the economy, and the financial markets. And also to understand the, the idea of reflexivity in terms of, of gauging the potential of one of those subsystems to become an autopoetic system. By autopoiesis, I mean a self-referential, self-reproducing system. And as the previous arguments about reflexivity suggested, my argument was that maybe at times, maybe all the time, this was a tendency within financial markets to become decoupled or from, to become disconnected from what was going on in the rest of the world, including my bank account in 97. So I also wanted to show how reflexive communication processes are therefore involved in the generation and annihilation of fictitious financial values, and how arguably they provide a symbolic fix to the contradictions in capital accumulation that was identified uh, by Marx. But Marx wasn't going to do the whole job because he didn't understand the symbolic dimensions of money. And so I try and revise the Marxist account of capital contradictions and accumulation crises through reference to, to informational feedback loops, and, and in particular, uh, Hyman Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. Now, I'm not going to have time to go into all of the theory today, but I'll talk a little bit about the research questions. Um, first one was a broad question about uh, how the markets had changed since the 1970s and how they were linked to communication and shifts between state capital and civil society. Uh, the second one was about how, this is the main empirical question, how do institutional finance professionals in New Zealand uh, prioritise different types of media and information when they make trading decisions and analyse markets? 
Um, thirdly, what are the implications of that empirical data uh, on, on their media usage uh, regarding the importance or an objectivity of, of different media forms for the theories of informational reflexivity. So I'm actually testing these ideas of reflexivity here. Then fourthly, I was looking for convergences and divergences within those, uh, within different markets across stocks, bonds, currencies, and derivatives to see if they varied. And finally, well, broadly speaking, having got those findings, does this suggest that financial markets have become an autopoetic system? And importantly, have they actually become more democratic, as some neoliberal commentators suggest, or actually have they become a world apart? So, the empirical side was an online survey of New Zealand institutional investors, uh, in-depth interviews with traders and analysts on the site, and several periods of limited but, but very useful non-participant observation uh, of trading rooms at Deutsche Bank, ANZ, and the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. So the survey, as I said, focused on the perceived importance and perceived objectivity of a range of different media and information types. And that was gauged on a seven-point uh, semantic scale, like a Likert scale. Um, the interviews and observations were then used to triangulate, and they explored the potential for self-referential inf you know, information flows to arguably become more important than market fundamentals. And so that became a gauge of communicative reflexivity. So this may be a bit small for the camera. I hope you can read it. Uh, these were the, the media mean importance ratings for the different information types. So way out in front uh, were, uh, were the specialist financial wires like Reuters and Bloomberg. Uh, specific work discussion was very important, as, one's, as was one's own professional analysis. So that, that straight away painted a picture. Way down the bottom were general broadcasts, general magazines, you know, general internet, things of general interest. So in terms of the media, specialism is good. You know, they're looking at the high-end services. That's what's really valuable here. I just note on that slide. Yes. A fifth ranking, I think, at the bottom is intuition and hunching. Yes, that was, that was also quite high. Uh, probably, probably as important as, in, as external information, you know, <coughs> chats to you know, people in other banks, um, specialist industry, industry reports. And what, what else was quite high? Um, you know, the discussion itself was, was very highly ranking. There's dialogue, you know, the, the, there's networks of dialogues with other institutions, particularly in the international banks, because they don't just talk to the colleagues on the next desk, but they phone up the, you know, the resident economic expert in New York and find out what's going on there. And those networks are very, very important. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they say that, that's a key, a key competitive advantage. Objectivity-wise, well, this is quite interesting. Um, I'll, 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 I'll say some more about this, but um, the most objective forms, well, specialist financial wires were quite high, specialist industry reports. Um, intuition and hunches, interest, interestingly, was actually quite a bit lower than their importance rating. So I'll, I'll get to the point on this, and that the correlations between the perceived importance and the perceived objectivity of, the, of these different media were, were, only, were only very marginally related. In about half the cases, there was no relation. Um, in a, the other half, you know, you're talking about very, very marginal correlations. And although they're significant, you know, to, to sometimes to a scale of zero, zero, zero on a, you know, on a, on a, on a Pearson coefficient, um, really their, their, their level is something like 0.2, maybe 0.3. So that, that there's not a strong relationship between them. And what that suggests is that the level of importance has really relatively little to do with whether the media were regarded as being impartial or whether they were providing an accurate and objective guide to market conditions. And, and that's, that's certainly not what the textbook says. You know, that, that, that you'd expect the, the, the objectivity of the media to be a key driver of their importance. And in fact, there's not really any strong relationship there. The medium rated most important, the financial wires, actually had no correlation with its objectivity rating, although it was relatively high in both cases. And the medium relate rated least important, which was general magazines, actually was correlated with its, with its objectivity rating, but only at a marginal level. So that, that's a problem, I think, for the neoclassical position in markets. You know, that, that doesn't hang together if you're taking the, the neoclassical textbook into account. Now, meanwhile, I looked at a variety of information types, just on the importance scale. 
Um, and again, this is quite interesting. You know, market information was also very important. So that was the outstanding one. You know, fundamentals, technicals were, were pretty, pretty important. Um, but a whole variety of other, other factors came into play. You know, correlations of data sources, estimations of future market price, of course. You know, current market price goes without saying is vital. You know, other institutions' opinions, rival investor opinions, the general market mood. Now, they might not be rating at sort of 6.5 on the scale, but they're not rating at 1 or 2 either. You know, they, these are moderately important factors. And together, they suggest that the, that the traders are taking notice of a much wider range of variables than you get in your standard textbook. Now, what I did then was partly through a, a, a process of factor analysis and then the development of scales tested with Cronbach Alpha. I, I developed a, a series of scale variables that condense those vari various types in, into basically six types of, of, of category. There's the importance of public media, which can, you know, the, most of the media that you could go out on the street today and pick up without any problem, or switch on your TV or radio, or go on the internet and find. Versus the institutional media, where you're only likely to get those if you're, if you're paying you know, high-end money for Reuters and Bloomberg, you know, as an individual investor, or if you're well connected within these institutional networks. So this is the stuff you can't just get as Joe Public. So, and they came out quite clearly in the factor analysis. They were distinct. Um, objectivity of public media and institutional media hung together. They, they were directly developed from the first two categories. Okay? The other interesting thing is that when I looked at the information types, they broadly boiled down into two categories. There was market information, which includes market fundamentals on different levels, you know, on companies, on general markets, different types of stocks, um, and also technical data, things that you would consider generally important. This is the textbook stuff, the stuff that should matter. And reflexive information, which was basically all the rumours, the gauging of other people's opinions, second-guessing what the other guys down the road were going to do. So this is the stuff that in theory shouldn't matter. And what we find there is that although market information is certainly a bit more important, this isn't far behind. You know, so there's actually quite a significant you know, level of importance for those, those, those categories of reflexive information. So I thought, well, this is interesting. There's something going on here. So I thought, well, let's try and correlate these. Well, this is what came out. The importance of public information had a you know, moderate and very significant correlation with the importance of market information, the stuff that should matter. Okay? But that was coming from public media. Okay? The importance of institutional media was actually significantly, moderately correlated with reflexive information. But the institutional media appeared to have no correlation at all with the importance of market information. So the argument there is that the information that they're getting from these key institutional media, including Reuters and Bloomberg, has actually relatively little to do with give, giving them the textbook fundamentals. It's got to do with something else. Um, public media you know, had, didn't have a strong correlation with, uh, you know, with, with any, any sort of, sorry, public media wasn't correlated with its objectivity rating. There was a marginal correlation between institutional media and their objectivity rating. But I think it's those two correlations that come out as quite interesting because there's no relationship between public media and reflexive information. I mean, that's where I initially thought the rumours might come from. You actually get your, your, your core fundamentals from the, the institutional media and you get your rumours from the public media. It's the other way around. Yeah, and that, that was quite a surprise. So the institutional media are regarded as more important than public media Market information is regarded as generally more important than reflexive information. But the importance and objectivity aren't correlated for public media and only marginally for institutional media. So that's consistent with the other findings. But the public media importance exhibits as a moderate correlation with market information only. Institutional media importance is correlated with, with reflexive information only. And that was a bit of a surprise. So it wasn't so much an aha moment as what the heck. <laughs> so that's, that was interesting. So I then ran an over um, test of, of difference between the different market categories and also public media.